Well, it is my great honor to introduce to you our next speaker, all the way from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Dr. Edmund Storms. I've known Ed almost since the beginning of the Cold Fusion War, if that's what we want to call it. The title of his talk is My Life with Cold Fusion as a Reluctant Mistress. Is he be talking about Monica there? No, no, she wasn't reluctant. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to introduce that topic. But uh, let me give you a little background about Ed. He's one of the original cold fusion pioneers, but he's a uh, radio chemist and a chemical physics man. Uh, Washington State, Washington State University, I believe he got his Washington University. Washington University. St. Louis. St. Louis. I'm sorry, I got the wrong Washington yeah. State. Okay, <laughs> Washington <laughs> University, St. Louis, PhD. But the important thing is he worked at our national laboratory. Uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory for 34 years. When cold fusion broke, he was responsible for investigating it. He and his wife, Carol Talcott Storms, both found together tritium evolution from cells. He'll tell you about that. Later excess heat. He's been at many cold fusion conferences. He has done many fine reviews of the cold fusion effect, which, we, which he has published in many places, including MIT Technology Review. In fact, I think I have a slide of that. I, I'd like to put that up, if I may. Hold on, just one second. I should have had, had that handy. In 1994, that was published. So that was a great eye-opener. Journal of S uh, Society for Scientific Exploration, et cetera, et cetera, and last but not least, many fine articles in Infinite Energy magazine. We're here to have Ed tell us his latest impression of where the, of where the coal fusion field is going, where this mistress is taking us, and uh, let's have Ed come up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, nine years ago, many of us were lured into believing that the Pons Fleischmann effect would uh, solve the world's energy problems and make us all rich. <laughs> Unfortunately, that has not happened as yet. I'd like to tell you about my particular path through this uh, minefield <laughs> that was discovered, and uh, also tell you why I believe that many of our problems, or most of our problems, at least in the Pons Fleischmann effect, are caused by material problems. And, uh, and those are at the heart of the lack of reproducibility, which of course is at the heart of the lack of acceptance. Now when the announcement was made, I was working at Los Alamos, as Jean says, uh, doing fairly conventional work on uh, materials used in nuclear power in space. Nuclear rockets and nuclear power of various kinds. And when the announcement was made, um, it was like an atom bomb hitting Los Alamos, so to speak. Many uh, people dropped, dropped whatever they were doing. And there was tremendous excitement. Uh, there was creativity and uh, uh, communication uh, generated at the laboratory that was not seen since the war. A uh, great deal of money that was otherwise destined to make better atomic bombs was redirected into cold fusion. Many of us thought that was very appropriate. So uh, we, um, we, myself, my wife, and a number of people got the, the idea that perhaps the best way of looking at the, the phenomena was by trying to discover whether it could make tritium. Because we worked in a group where that had some of the world's experts in, in tritium, uh, identification and knowledge about tritium. They, they know tritium when they see it. And so we felt that that was the appropriate way to go. So our first approach <coughs> was to uh, electrolyze heavy water with a palladium cathode and, and look, look for tritium. And, and in our case, we would look for it in the electrolyte, and we would look for it in the, in the gas stream. And the apparatus that was used is shown here. <coughs> It consists of uh, a cell with uh, the electrodes, heavy water, and then it goes over to a plastic IV bag through a recombiner. Uh, for a while, we were the largest user of, of uh, IV bags in Los Alamos. But we would extract the, 
condens the uh, recombinate recombi here uh, with a hypodermic needle so we could keep track of tritium that was put into the cell and tritium that was taken out of the cell and the tritium that was left behind in the electrolyte and the tritium that was uh, allowed to go over into the gas phase. <coughs> now the <coughs> typical results of this effort are shown here. Now you can see these are two cells that were running together at the same time on the same bench top. This cell produced absolutely nothing. This is a fraction of excess tritium over and above that which was already in the cell. And this is time and days. And you see that, th don't follow the line, that's just th the computer doing that. But essentially there was a delay of about four days and then this cell started making tritium. These little things mean nothing, that's just uh, scattering the data. But then there are two clear bursts here and then it became a, a constant uh, value. That, that's fairly typical of um, the um, behavior. Now, this work was uh, written up, and because it was controversial, it was subjected to a rather extensive review at Los Alamos, consisting of 12 people that were chosen from the laboratory. And they had their go at it, and we made some changes, and then it was submitted to Fusion Technology, and, and they had a go at it, and it was eventually published. Um, the, the papers written by skeptics should receive that much attention. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, it uh, uh, had essentially no effect on the field. People generally ignored it. And, and why is that? Well, the skeptics would say, well, first of all, there's two obvious sources of tritium. One is the environment in which the cells were sitting. Uh, it, it came in. Los Alamos is known to have tritium all over the place. Um, I, by whom I don't know, but that's what they would say. Um, and uh, they say, well, it was, it was in the palladium in the first place. You just got bad palladium that somebody had contaminated. <clears throat> well, we searched for it in the environment. Of course, we couldn't find any. I mean, the health physics people there are very diligent about that. They don't want us breathing tritium any more than we want to breathe it. And <clears throat> so there's, there's very little tritium around where it's not supposed to be. I mean, of course, other places, <laughs> lots of it. Um, and then we'd analyze the palladium to find out if the, there was any tritium in it, and of course there wasn't. And, and this has been done by a num number of researchers. Um, they've looked at tritium from all over the world. There just simply is not tritium, I mean uh, palladium from all over the world. There simply is not tritium in palladium. So uh, that being the case, we decided to take the opposite approach. We said, all right, if we take the cell <clears throat> and put it in a tritium environment, that we know tritium is surrounding it, and we take a piece of palladium and we put tritium in it. So we know there's tritium in the, the palladium. And then we run the system. If we get the same behavior as we got when we thought there was the absence of this, then we have a clear explanation. So we put a cell into a uh, room where there was known tritium contamination. And as you might expect, <coughs> the, once it was in the room, the tritium level in the cell rose and then it reached a steady state, as you would expect. In other words, there was an instantaneous uh, increase, no delay, and then essentially a uh, leveling off to a constant value. Well, that's quite different than what you saw earlier in terms of our tritium production. And besides that, we would have cells running simultaneously, some of which would produce tritium and some of wh which would not. So they were both exposed to the same environment. The other, the other thing um, that we noticed when tritium was produced in the uh, cold fusion cells, the, the tritium always was produced in the electrolyte. It was not produced in the gas. And uh, that was very interesting. That was an important discovery. So when we ran uh, the palladium that contained known tritium, this is what we got. <coughs> 